So if I don't, there's going to be consequences. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou, uh, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, these are false teachers which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. And Lord, you knew exactly uh, who would be in this uh, service today. And you know exactly what our needs are, our spiritual needs. And Lord, without your help, we won't recognize them today. Uh, We won't see our own heart. We won't understand, Lord, what our relationship with you is really like. And so we're asking you, Father, as a church, that you would be pleased to let the Holy Spirit uh, speak to us one-on-one about our standing and our condition before you. Where is our heart? Lord, are we walking away or are we pursuing you in love? And Lord, whichever the case is, in order for us to respond to you this morning, we need your help to see it, to know it so that we can have an opportunity to make right decisions and right choices. And I ask you, Father, that you help us to make that right choice as the Holy Spirit of God deals with our heart. Would you please encourage us and help us to bend the knee before Christ, to acknowledge our own sin, and Lord, to get right with you. Help us to be obedient to this passage of Scripture. Lord, have your way. If there's uh, any in this service that are lost, They've never been born again, born from above. God, would you speak to their heart about the need of being saved and help them this morning to come to Christ to be saved. Lord, help us in this service, please. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Out of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Ephesus is really the only church that we have a lot of scriptural information about. More is written about Ephesus, uh, clearly abundantly more than any of the other churches that are mentioned. If you want to, you could go and read the book of Acts, chapter 18 through 20, and you'll see many of the events that took place in the early days of God establishing that church, the church at Ephesus. We also have an epistle or letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians is this little epistle, and we're told about the ministers who ministered there. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila ministered there. What a great New Testament couple that labored together for the cause of Christ, effective in their ministry, and they were part of building up the church at Ephesus. Also, Apollos came to preach at Ephesus. You may remember how Priscilla and Aquila took him home and taught him more perfectly the gospel. And from that uh, time forward, Apollos was preaching the clear gospel of Christ. So Apollos, that great orator, preached at the church at Ephesus. Timothy, Silas, and even John, the writer of the book of Revelation, ministered there and pastored there. How would you like to have Uh, John, the disciple, as your pastor. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Or to have Timothy, one that the Apostle Paul trained. Of course, we know that the Apostle Paul labored there for two years. Wouldn't that be an amazing opportunity to learn much about Christ? The center of the ministry of the Apostle uh, Paul. And so, the Bible gives us a lot of information about this church. But, Listen to me. Only 30 years later is John penning these words. 30 years. 30 years from going to a church that is passionate about Christ, that is deeply devoted to Christ, that loves Christ above anything else and everyone else to a warning 
that you're still busy, you're still doing a lot of things, great things, but the main thing you've forsaken, and that is your love for me. Isn't that sad? Over such a short period of time, uh, you may have noticed when you walked into the sanctuary, the men might get on to me about this, uh, pointing out the white spot on the back there. We didn't have time to paint it. But before it was just a hole. <laughs> and so we've made a little bit of progress. But I was telling Brother Phil, it's amazing that in this world, if you don't give attention to something on a consistent basis, it'll fall apart. Right? I mean, your home, vehicles, listen to me, even your marriage. You know why a lot of marriages end up and people going in a different direction? is because they stopped working on it. They just got used to living together in the same house, but they left off romance and love, and uh, their hearts are drawn away to someone else. You've got to constantly work on having a, a close relationship with your husband or with your wife if you're going to maintain the marriage that, that the Bible would have us to have. Amen? Well, let me also say this. You've got to constantly maintain your relationship with Christ as well. Amen? Now, it's not that Christ is ever lacking in His part. He's always, always doing His part, but we are easily distracted creatures. We are so easy to get our eyes cast on something else or someone else that if we're not careful, we neglect the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the writer in the book of Hebrews warned us about this. In Hebrews chapter 2, we find these words in verses 1 through 3. Therefore we ought to give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Ever found that to be true in your own Christian life? You've got a hold of this doctrine. Boy, it's been such a blessing to you. You know the truth of it. And then a year or two down the road, it's kind of muddled in your mind and you no longer are refreshed and encouraged by that truth that you found in the Word of God. Is that easy to take, take place in your heart as a Christian? It is. Uh, we sing a song in our hymn books, page 11, and it says, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. There's something about this heart that has that tendency, this flesh, I should say, that has that tendency. And so the writer of Hebrews warns us to give an earnest heed to the things we've seen and heard. He says in verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward... Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Does that sound like a warning to you? You know what? There's a large number of believers that are neglecting so great a salvation. It's one thing to be lost and blinded to that, but when you've been born again and you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside and a constant reminder of the presence of Christ, for you to, to neglect that, that's an altogether different story. Amen? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? In Philippians chapter 2, we find this in verse 12. Paul says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, he said, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now please hear what that passage said. It did not say work for your salvation with fear and trembling. It didn't say that. It said work it out. I mean learn how to live it. Practice it. Be a genuine follower of Christ. How should my heart feel toward that I should fear and trembling. I shouldn't just, oh, okay, well, it might not, whatever happens, happens. No, 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 no. There needs to be an earnest effort on our part 
in having a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and something happened to this wonderful, amazing group of believers. When you're reading the things that are mentioned about the church at Ephesus, I think any of us would blush if th- those things were said about us. Right? If you had all these commendations coming one after the other, you'd say, wow. I mean, that's a model church. Wouldn't we probably use that term? Well, that's a church like I'd like to be a part of a church like that. Right? And yet there was a major problem. Look, if you would, they were energetically serving the Lord. Verse 2 says, I know thy works and thy labor. And look at verse 3. It says, For my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. I mean, how many times can you say in a short little passage like this, this church was busy, actively involved in doing the work of God. I mean, they were constantly busy about the things of God, the work of God, your work, your labor. Labor means a beating. Means You look it up in uh, your Strong's Accordance. It means intense labor united with trouble and toil. You get that? Intense labor united with trouble and and toil, even in problems, even in hard times, even when it was difficult. The church at Ephesus was busy, laboring, working. Isn't that a commendable statement that's made? That not only were they energetically serving the Lord, they also endured persecution. The word patience means steadfast endurance. Patience usually means endurance joyful endurance while going through a difficulty. You remember the early days at the church in Ephesus? Who was put in, put in prison with Paul? Silas. Where they just take, take it to a comfortable cell and said, here's a you know, cable TV and your meal will be delivered in a little while. No. They were beaten, bloody, bruised, put in stocks and chains. And they sang and they worshipped and they glorified God. And that's how this church was born. The jailer that was watching over them came to Christ. I mean, other people were saved. Right? Because of Paul and their work. And and remember, Paul was cast in prison because of the worship of false God. And so... They were faithful even in difficult times. Wouldn't you love that to be, you know, when you're standing before Christ on the day of judgment and He said, look, I looked at your life and in the good times you were faithful to serve Christ and then when those difficult times came you were also just as faithful in your patient endurance of uh, trouble and trials. Not only that, they eschewed evil, right? Did you see what it said in verse 2? It says, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. We can't tolerate that. Doesn't that sound like a church that that wants to see people live holy, godly lives? That doesn't put up with sin and, and wrongdoing? They hated evil. They couldn't tolerate evil. By the way, if, if America's going to experience revival, we've got to get back to hating sin. Amen? I'm not hating the sinner. That's not what I'm saying. But, but stop looking at sin as though, okay, it's just an alternate lifestyle. Or, oh, that's up to you how you live. No, no, no. And so they eschewed evil. They exposed false teachers. Uh, I remember one time Pastor Rick was preached here on a Sunday night. And he mentioned some TV preachers. He mentioned Benny Hinn, Jesse Duplantis. He mentioned some of the statements they made. He exposed, and by the way, they are false teachers. He exposed false teachers. Did a good job exposing false teachers. And this church did that as well. They say they're followers of Christ, but let me tell you, their doctrine's off. They, they would say, listen, this is the truth. These men are not apostles. 
We know apostles, and they are not chosen of Christ. I mean, every one of these things are just so commendable. And then he says, but I have somewhat against thee. I have somewhat against thee. I want you to notice the priority of love. Thou hast left thy first love. 1 Corinthians 13 makes this clear, doesn't it? Love is really the, the goal. It is the most important thing. It is the priority of your life and my life. If we're going to be like Christ, we need to learn to love others. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, If I give my body to be burned and have not charity, that doesn't, it won't, it, it's not going to benefit me. I mean, I can throw my body in the fire, but if I didn't throw it in there because of love, I just wasted it. It didn't mean nothing. It didn't count for nothing. He also says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I can empty my bank account and God can look at that and say, it doesn't mean a thing to me. But Lord, I gave it to poor people. He said, I know you gave it to poor people, but you didn't give it out of the right motive. You didn't do it because you love me or you love them. And by the way, there, there are many other motives for doing things, right? Can you imagine that? Emptying your bank account and God saying it didn't mean anything to me. And he'll continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're not, uh, 13. We're not spending a lot more time here. He says in verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. It vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. So if it's not done out of love, there's no reward in heaven for it. There's no value in it. There, there's a great problem with it. A, a lawyer, a student of the law, came to Christ in Mark chapter 12 and he said, I want to know what is the most important commandment, the greatest, the number one commandment, but all other commandments. What is it? And Jesus said, There's the, the Lord our God is one Lord. And he said, and you're to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the number one commandment, the most important commandment. You say, preacher, I want to please Christ. The most important thing in pleasing Christ is loving Christ. That's what God desires from you more than anything else in all the world. And isn't this a testimony? I mean, when you read the church of Ephesus, that's great, commendable. That's amazing. That's good. But he said, I've got a problem with you. You left off love. You're doing a lot of things, but you're not doing it out of love. He said the second is likened to that, that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen? So loving God and loving others is the fulfillment of the law. That is the goal of the law. That is what God wants. He doesn't just want activity and busyness, right? He wants you to love Him. And Ephesus forgot that. So it's a priority. Remember in John chapter 21, before Jesus was sent back up into heaven, Peter and the other disciples are around a little fire, and Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know, I love you. And then he asked him again, Peter, do you, do you really love me? And he said, Lord, you know, you know I love you. And he asked him a third time. And Peter's getting a little bit, Lord, I've answered this, you know, several times. You know all things. You know that I love you. Isn't that interesting? He said, he didn't say, now Peter, are you going to go preach for me? 
Uh, Peter, are you going to build the church? Peter, are you going to be a good leader? Peter, when I leave, can I really depend on you to carry this gospel until the day that you die? And Peter probably would answer yes to all of that. But only love would cause him to do that. Amen? That's the most important thing. I wonder if you could look in your heart and see the level of love that you have for Jesus today. I wonder where that would be at. Would there be an overflowing fountain of love for Christ in your heart? That's what He deserves. Or, if you looked at that vessel, would it be just a bare little bit on the bottom left? Not much love at all. Notice, secondly, the preference of love. In other words, what God is saying is, I would rather have love, now correct me if I'm wrong, I'd rather have love than anything else I've just mentioned. Right? That, that's what he prefers. He prefers love. Now don't get me wrong, if love's there, these other works will certainly be there. Amen? But he's saying, listen, I'd rather have your heart than your hands. I'd rather have love than, than, than just your legs. I'd, I'd rather have you than what you do. Now, isn't that true with every single one of us? It ought to be. If it's not true, it ought to be. We, we don't just want someone to do some things for us. We want someone that loves us. Isn't that true? I mean, when you're looking for a husband or a wife, you're looking for someone that loves you. Right? Not someone that can do this, or someone that can do that, someone that can do this. No, I want someone that cares for me. That wants to be with me. That enjoys being around me. That loves my presence. And just tolerate my presence. Right? But they love my presence. I told them in Sunday school, Brenda and Carrie got a big scare yesterday. They were over at Vicky's house for a little while and they came back by the house and I made it home from working over here at the church. And they said, we're going out to eat. I said, well, have fun. And then they come back and their fire truck's parked in my driveway. And and them. One fire truck there, another one coming in. And Brenda's mind went to the worst case scenario. <laughs> And I think Carrie's mind works a lot like her mother's. And so it went to that same place. And uh, they drove in there. And sadly, it was the neighbor that was having some difficulties. They had to call 911, but they had to use our driveway to park so they could get to the neighbor's house. But I'm glad that when she drove up on that scene, she said, Oh, I, my husband, I... Is he all right? Is everything well? That's what love does, right? You see how that's preferred above anything else that's mentioned here? You know what Jesus said? If you love me, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now he's interested in what we do, but he's more interested in why we do it. You can do something but you can do it completely the wrong for the wrong reason. In Galatians chapter 1, remember, uh, Paul is writing to those that are preaching. They're preaching a gospel. And he said, I wish that you were accursed and cast into hell because it was a false gospel. They were preaching a gospel, but they were preaching it all wrong. It was not helping men, it was hindering men. You can, do, you can do something, but you can do it for the wrong reason. Love is the greatest when it comes to the purpose of doing this. Love is the greatest reason. And that's, the, that's exactly what God wants from you. He wants you to do it, but He wants you to do it because that you love Him. Why is love preferred? Because it's the purest motive. It's the purest motive. 
Even among the church, you can do certain things for many different reasons, right? Uh, why do you teach that Sunday school class? Well, because nobody else would. Have you ever heard people say that before? That's a pretty sad reason. In fact, it's probably better for you not to be teaching Sunday school if that's the only reason you're teaching it. Well, why are you doing this? Well, you know, it has to be done. Somebody has to do it. That's not, that's not the right motive. <laughs> that's not the right reason. Right? I'm doing this because it's my way of saying to Jesus, I love you. And I believe I might help others to love him. That's, that's my reason for what I'm doing. It's the purest motive that's out there. You know, some people, and you know this is true, are really strict about the way they live, and they say they're strict about their diet, they're strict about everything. But what's their motive? Let me give you an example. Uh, Mormons. Right? They won't eat, uh, they won't drink coffee and eat chocolate and... I mean, they have this long list of stuff, and well, they do this, and they're real disciplined, and they have morals. And a lot of people say they're good people, right? But why is it that they're trying so hard to be good people? Because they want to be a god someday. Uh oh, that's that's a that's a horrific reason and motive, isn't it? Because you want to be your own god. Remember Jehovah's Witnesses, the 144,000? Well, I'm working so hard and knocking on so many doors because I want to be a part of that 144,000. I want to make it to the paradise. And it has nothing to do with loving Jesus. Right? And you and I who are genuinely born again, like those at Ephesus, could be doing the same thing for the wrong reason. The purest motive. It's also the highest motive, right? Not fear. You know, sometimes people do things, the highest motive. Sometimes they will, I'm just afraid, you know. I give my tithe. Why? Because I'm afraid God will just tend to devour and just consume everything else. Now, now don't get me wrong. Fearing the Lord is good. The Bible says that's the beginning of knowledge. But there's a higher motive than fear. Love casteth out all fear. If it's fear, you're going to be limited. Why? You're going to do just what you think you need to do to escape the fear level. <laughs> you're not going to be hilarious in your giving. You're not going to be generous in your giving. You're just going to give that little bit that says, I'm, I'm past the fear line. Have you ever mistakenly felt this way? I need an answer to prayer, so I better really start checking the way I'm living. And you want favoritism now, right? You want God to look down on you and say, well, you've been really good lately, so I'm going to give you what you desire. You know, when we've done our best, we've still fallen far short of what we ought to be doing. And Jesus said about the servant that came in from working all day in the field, he said, did the master of the servant say, sit down, I'll, I'll fix a meal for you? He said, no. The servant fixed the meal, fed the master. Then the, when the master was finished eating, then he ate, and he said that servant should say, I've only done what a servant is required to do. That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. Amen? No. You're never going to do enough to earn anything from God. So, so it's the highest motive because it's not that I'm doing this because I want God to give me something or God to help me in some way. No, I'm doing it whether He helps me or not. You say, why do people get burnt out in the ministry, Brother Tommy? Because they're trying to get, get something from God. They, they, they're, they're doing it because there's a purpose behind it other than love. You, you, you check into that to see whether that's not so. And when you do it, there's, and the motive is not love, 
it'll wear you out sooner or later. But if it's love, it, and no matter what happens, it's okay. Remember Job? I think Job is a good picture of that. He didn't serve God for what he got from God. He served God because he was God. And he was worth the worship and the service. Amen? And that's how God wants us to treat him as well. But notice finally the punishment for the lack of love. You see that? The punishment for the lack of love. Look at verse 5. He said, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove the candlestick out of his place. The warning here is that Christ would come and he would take the church out of Ephesus. There'd be no, no church, no living body of Christ there. Is that a scary thought? It should be. If you go to Ephesus today, which is Turkey, current uh, time Turkey, you're not going to find the church at Ephesus. Wouldn't it have been a beautiful thing that if we could say in 2020, hey, the church of Ephesus is still there, still going, and still doing God's work, and they still love Jesus. Wouldn't that be an amazing testimony? Sadly, it's not there. The candlestick was taken away. The word left means to send away. Depart, a husband divorcing his wife to leave, to go away from. They didn't lose it. They just started walking away from loving Christ. What, what causes someone to no longer love someone else like they once did? Has that ever shocked you when people are, they first meet one another? I mean, they talk on the phone all the time. They, Used to they write letters back and forth, now texting, and I mean it's like you know twenty four seven. You're always talking about them or to them, or you're always with them, right? And then they're married a year or two years, and each one's busy about something else. What causes that? Was well, when we stop spending time with Jesus, when you stop spending time with Jesus, that's why it's so important that you learn to open up your Bible daily and spend some time in prayer. That's why it's important to be faithful in church attendance as well. When you stop spending time with Jesus, your love for Him wanes. Sometimes when couples get married, before they're married, they just were one. Then they get married, they get busy about their work and their life, and they get focused on those things. And even though they're in the same house, they're not really spending time together anymore. Right? Is that true or not? Maybe they were busy about doing things for Christ, and they did not spend any time with Christ. We stop speaking with one another. You know what I'm talking about, right? Not just the, hey, how are you today? <laughs> but I'm talking about you sharing your heart. I mean, the closest times that Brenda and I have been together is when we've opened up our heart, shared well, everything that was in our heart. The things you wouldn't share with anybody else. Right? And when you stop doing that with Christ, guess what happens? your heart starts getting cold. Listen to me. If you're not sharing your heart with Christ, you're sharing your heart with someone else. Brother Otis, my father-in-law said, in the divorce, there's always three parties involved. Always. The husband, the wife, and then somebody else. And it said it might not be a real person. It might just be an imaginary person that they've made up in their mind. Their husband doesn't fit this picture. Or their wife no longer fits this picture. And because they don't fit this picture in their mind, their, their, their love for their wife or husband drops off. When we moved in the house we're living in now, Brenda found a note. That the family before us went through a divorce. And she found a note where the wife 
had written out pros and cons. And she never shared that with me. <laughs> I think probably because a lot of cons were on my side as well. And she said, you don't need to read that. And she said, it was just so picky. Little things. On the list of reasons I should divorce. And if you don't... If you don't share your heart with Christ, you don't spend time with Jesus, you'll start loving somebody else. And that's the last step when you start loving others. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is what? Enmity with God. He said, you're a Christian and you're going out here flirting with the world? Holding hands? Could you imagine if you drove up and you saw your wife holding another man's hand? I mean, that would be outrageous, right? You'd be ready to fight. Or vice versa. You came home or you saw your husband walking down the road, road with, holding a woman's hand. Would you stop the car and say, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> I know Miss Brenda would. <laughs> Name, social security number, address. What are you doing? He belongs to me. Right? Well, what happened at Ephesus? Why did they leave Christ? They started loving something else, right? Where, where's your heart today? And if Jesus were to come to you and say, how much do you love me? Or do you love me? What would you ask? He gives three simple things we could do. He said, remember. Remember. Remember how it used to be with Christ? And you need to go back to the day you were saved. It, it, it probably, some of you good just to write out your salvation experience again. Just, and you said, I've told it so many times, but it would be easier to write now. Amen? And remember where He brought you from, how He saved you. Remember how He changed your heart and how, how in those early days you'd do anything for Jesus. Amen? And then He said also, repent. Stop doing those things that substitute love for Christ. Get back to saying, Jesus, I want to hear Your voice. I want to respond to You. I want to demonstrate my love to You. I don't want to just do stuff and activity. I want to please You. And then lastly said, redo. Do the first works. Go back to doing what you used to do. Right? And some of you, that, that's getting up a little bit early in the morning and reading the Bible. Amen? Some of that means faithful attendance. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Last Sunday night, Brother Bruce preached an amazing message. would help every single one of us. helped me to hear it. I promise if you were here, it would have helped you a lot as well. Every time you're not in church, Sunday school, this morning, we are looking at the little book of Hosea and how God loved Israel so much, even though they were so unfaithful to Him. But isn't that good to hear about how God loves even an unfaithful people? Isn't that helpful? Avail yourself of every opportunity you've got. You can turn on the TV or radio on the way over to church this morning. Brenda turned on and uh, Adrian Rogers was on preaching. Amen. What a blessing that is. Amen? You don't need less of the Word of God. You need more of the Word of God. Get back to doing what you once did. Memorizing Scripture. When's the last time you memorized a passage of Scripture? Some of you used to do it all the time. And it's been a long time since you've memorized anything out of the Word of God. Hey, get back to doing what you did when you first fell in love with Jesus. Amen? This, in this service this morning, if you sense an absence of love for Christ, don't you think it would please Him to come and kneel on the altar and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I have been loving others. I'm loving myself. And I'm not loving you like I should. Forgive me. Wouldn't that be a good first step? And if you've never known Christ as your Savior, why don't you come this morning, put your faith and trust in Him. Amen?
Jesus loves you. And He will save you if you'll ask Him to today, alright? Let's stand for a word of prayer.